Are you ready to go beyond pen test reporting? Elevate your offensive security and measure risk reduction by streamlining pen test planning, report creation, and findings delivery. Request and attend a one on one personalized demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash plextrack, and plextrack will send you a Starbucks $10 euro or pounds gift card totally free just for your time. That's securityweekly.com forward slash plextrack. When it comes to ensuring your company has top-notch security practices, things can get complicated and time-consuming fast. Now you can assess risk, secure the trust of your customers, and automate compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and more with a single platform, Vanta. Vanta's leading trust management platform helps you automate evidence collection, unify risk management, and streamline security reviews. Save hours of work by completing security questionnaires with Vanta AI. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash Vanta to watch their on-demand demo. That's securityweekly.com slash V-A-N-T-A. Application Security Weekly delivers interviews and news from the worlds of AppSec, DevOps, and all the other ways people find and fix software flaws. Join us as we explore how the latest news highlights modern security practices or reminds us of the missing ones. We also bring insights from interviews on topics from training to threat modeling, from open source tools to cloud native techniques, plus an occasional reference from new wave to synth wave. Find us at securityweekly.com slash subscribe or look for Application Security Weekly wherever you pick your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. You can follow Security Weekly on Instagram at SecWeekly. There you can find a whole bunch of clips from the shows, and hopefully there are more coming. Speaking of more people coming, Mr. Sam Bound has joined us. Good evening. Glad to be here. Sam, welcome. Did Lee Neely's not joining us? No? No Lee. Okay. No. And uh, Jeff had a hot date with a man. He did. His wife. Mrs. Man. Mrs. Man. Right. Right? Yes. <laughs> uh, All right, Larry, you hey, had oh, uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> just an quick, announcement. A couple <clears throat> quick things, just some upcoming speaking stuff. Um, I'll be at RSA uh, speaking, uh, coming up here in too many short weeks that I don't even remember when RSA is, but it's soon. Um it's cool. I get to speak at RSA for my first time. Then you know you've made it, right? Wow. The, the, the talks at like Congratulations. Eight, the talks at like eight thirty in the morning though. So <clears throat> yeah, everybody'll be like Bill and you know, have had too many beers the night before and it's all right. But you know, it's there. It's there. It'll be like three people in the audience. Uh the other one, uh uh I was in S four in Miami last week and next week I'll be in Detroit, <laughs> speaking at Auto Cyber um, on uh, moving forward with connected device. Detroit is nice this time of year. It is, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's not Miami. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that that way. it is not. No, I'll be in uh, Baltimore in April. Nice, April nineteenth ish for so, Besides Charm. So about the same as Detroit, but yeah, with more ocean, and yeah, yeah, and it'll be uh, Besides Charm. So I'll be talking nice. about, I'm speaking, I'll be talking about uh, the hot mess that's CVE. Nice, nice. So great segue, but uh, I've got to segue real quick first. Because yes. we never start with my story, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but hey, Larry, I think we should start with your story. Sweet, <laughs> sweet. So uh, first, because my second story goes to the, your segue. Oh, yeah, uh, it does. My first story, uh, S-bombing a substation. Uh, oh, was it, was so, it, okay, we're starting with your story number my one. My story number one. Okay. Um, which uh, I apologize. It's not a blog post. It's a PDF of a slide of, of a slide deck. It's a pretty cool slide deck. And though. Uh, so this was uh, my boss, Matt Wickhouse, uh, one of my bosses, Matt Wickhouse, and uh, Alex Waitkus of Southern Company, who put together a project over the last year to try to get S-bombs for an entire one of their uh, substations. And the challenges that they encountered mm -hmm. and the problems and I it, heard about this it, research. It was it was an amazing it was an amazing talk and quite honestly the slide deck is and, amazing and the game that they put together for the slide deck is just But also the amazing. concept is amazing. And I'm totally stealing this uh from uh my, my good friend Josh Corman. Because uh, he referenced this research. <laughs> and Mandy was on this call, so she knows exactly. where I'm going, I was like, right? I, yeah, yeah I'm, like, Josh oh, yeah, I'm is, so glad we're talking about this. I know, because right? Josh is smarter than me, so I'm just going to steal what he said. And he was like, you know, a lot of vendors complain that they can't have an S-bomb. There's a million excuses why you can't have an S-bomb. But 
here we are, Matt and, and company, doing this uh, project where we're trying to create an S bomb for uh, ICS gear, yeah. and they can totally do it. <laughs> you get the, right, and you get all these other people going. We can't, we can't, we can't. That's not, that's not possible. Like, yeah, no, you know, like, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. Larry, just give me the link. There it is. It's possible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, don't. It's not without its challenges. Don't no, get me wrong. No, no, no. I didn't say it was easy. And but. you know, and there's there's lots of issues with you know folks that don't want to share Ooh. and the way they feel that they need to share. Like, I think one that really gave it that that like was one of the more impactful things that they got out of that was uh, one of their vendors. Uh, Southern Company went to to get an S-bomb for one of the devices in their mm -hmm. their substation. They said, look, we want an S-bomb. We're trying to put an S-bomb together for everything in the substation. And the vendor came back and said, and they shared their redacted email, said, sorry, uh, the rules that went into effect that require us to give you S-bombs, uh, this product was manufactured before the date of that rule. So we don't have to give you one, and we're not going to. Mm, okay, so we'll just generate our own. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So, they, like, I thought that was crazy. Like, hey, we have an S bomb. It's in production. It's in the. It's in the environment. We need to do good for our security. We want to understand what's going on in our environment, what we have there, and you won't give it to me because it was before the regulation came out. Like, mm. you can't tell me you don't have the source code or firmware that you could generate one. But no, I mean. It would require them to do work, I guess. I don't know. Very true. Yep. But not an excuse. Nope. Not an excuse. It's one they use, but not an excuse. <clears throat> Mandy? Yes. So, Larry, I'm looking through your story for the first time here and agreed. This is really awesome. But does it mention the age of components that they were doing the S bombs for? Uh, they did not mention the age of the components that they were doing the S bombs for. Um, but arguably in, in pretty typical fashion, if we start talking about ICS and in this case, uh, the electric industry, um, it's likely there were potentially items in that substation that could have been up to 30 years old. Um, See, I was thinking, yeah, because even with Josh Corman, as we were talking about like the 30 to 50 year old yep. range, depending on when they were implemented. Yep. Uh, now, arguably this substation was a relatively new newly populated substation so we were probably not talking 30 years old worth of stuff we're we're definitely talking uh newer gear that was likely reasonably uh acquirable for for stuff um if i remember correctly like uh the the device that they were told no you can't have one because it's older um was let me see here um yeah it's on slide eight um the the stuff was the the product software was released um prior to september 14th 2022 so uh we're not going to give you it hmm. and it wasn't that much before from my understanding so um bill you're on mute <clears throat> I heard I heard Bill that you used a flipper zero to steal a car to to get home. Is that is that true? No, I still can't hear you. It's the other mute. And the other mute. <clears throat> and the other mute. Nope. We're carrying the interview for carrying the uh, second for Bill. We're gonna carry the rest of the show for Bill. Yeah, he, that's awesome. Yeah, I, yeah he's back. Right. Yeah, hey. Bill, so I want you, I, you, I, you told us how to steal a car with a flipper zero, but you were muted, so I yeah. missed it. <laughs> Hold on a second. I want to go back to the S-bomb. I think, mm. like, if you have a vendor that, that is ref refusing to give you one, uh, you know, that's exactly where you start with, with the, the pen testing, right? So I, I, I tend to think, you know, not knowing who that vendor was or what that part in, in that environment is, those kind of things, that to me stands out as something that, they probably could. Uh, they don't want to, right? <laughs> yeah. And and they're and they're they're leaning on their their legal team to figure out a way to to not do that. Probably because there's some vulnerable components in there that they're all aware of and don't don't know how to fix or don't want to fix that. Yeah, right. I mean, so I mean, I can't say for sure, but you read between the lines, and that's what it looks like. Or you could very much make the case for it. Also, uh, <laughs> Josh Corman is our guest for next week. Nice. So we'll dig more into that uh, with Josh. Cool. So, Bill, can you steal a car with a flipper zero? 
Well, so every car that I've tried stealing, I needed more, uh, you know, I've needed more equipment than just the Flipper Zero. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that. Um, Unless you're in Canada, because yeah. that makes you special there, right? Right. Unless it's a Canadian car, right? A Canadian Tesla. Those, uh, from what I hear, are pretty easy to steal. But, Bill, I thought it was just more than Teslas you could steal with the, like, they had to ban Flipper Zeros in Canada because you, it was going to stop the theft of automobiles because you don't have a flipper anymore. Well, yeah. Well, well yeah. Wait, hold on. I had, I had something. I, I mean, like, I had something so, you know, this. obviously this has been, a, you know, a, a uh, just in the news a lot lately, uh, you know, so ever since the, the flipper zero has been released, you know, it's, it's been an interesting, um, you know, it's a tool, it's a toy. It, um, it, it's a great introduction into uh, a, a lot of like RF and other radio frequency type, um, you know, just uh, exploration, I guess would be the right way. Um, you know, but th this, we've kind of talked about this on, on you know, on, on this podcast in the past that um, just because it can be used for bad, right? So if you remember, like, you know, it was, um, you know, well, four or five months ago, um, well, actually, I guess it was it was longer than that. It was uh, around DEF CON last year when we started seeing the the BLE type spam and yep. uh, and, and those kind of things. And, and then it got ported to the flipper and, uh, you know, and, and then all of a sudden, though, you know, people were saying that the flipper device is, uh, you know, potentially dangerous because of, heart monitors or, you know, any other kind of, of metal, medical equipment that have, you know, Bluetooth lower energy, whatever. But, you know, we talked about it back then. Um, you know, it's just like if, I, you know, if we were to go to, to Home Depot, right, and, and ask for that, you know, which which hammer do I use to murder someone, right? I think, you know, we, right. I think we talked about that before, right? Or go to Home Depot and buy a bunch, a whole bunch, a whole bunch of PVC pipe to build a potato cannon, right? right. And then but, shoot, I mean, this yeah. is, when we talk about the BLE spam, like that's something the flipper can actually do. Yep. When we talked about it in, the, in context of the traffic lights, that's something, it's part of the like kit that so you, you need. Yeah. It can be part of the kit that you uh, use for that. Uh, I've also seen it <clears throat> cloning uh, key fobs for vehicles, mm -hmm. which it can, but we're talking like really older vehicles mm -hmm. that like yep. basically have the NFC or it RFID <laughs> Um, uh, no, component in it. R, R, it, it, was, is it, it what RF. is it on the older older it's, Hondas? It's, but there's not just Hondas. It's, older cars. It's still RF and still for some new ones because the, it was the uh, the unoriginal Rice Paddy and a few others yes. that have found that uh, even modern Hondas don't use any type of. Some of them do not use any type of rolling code. Rolling it's codes. just a matter of capture and replay. Right. G right. Patriots, uh, old late model <clears throat> G Patriots. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's possible with mm -hmm. the flip. Not all of them, right? Because it depends on chipset and frequency. It, it doesn't cover all the. Yeah, that's why you need the unlocked <clears throat> firmware. Oh, so. But aren't there some mm. supercars that it was going on? Like I think even Dork Phoenix did on her McLaren. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah she did. So she's a Kansas. City, she is set KC. Uh, mm. You know, yeah. Kansas City native, and uh, and yeah, she got her McLaren uh, to. But but again, and and that McLaren did have a rolling code, right? And and so basically, what you're doing is you're you're as long as you can capture that that uh, that pulse uh, without the car hearing it, right? Then you can replay it because mm -hmm. it's, it's expecting that code, right? So right, that, that's right, what they right, did with her. Right. Yes, with her car. well put. I'm glad we got that got that out there so, for people to understand because there's some people on the internet that either don't understand that or like to sensationalize it. As is the way the press uh, portrayed the research that was the Flipper Zero can steal a Tesla Model 3 when really they're just doing a Wi-Fi based man in the middle attack, essentially, to get your credentials to log into your Tesla account, which sure you can use a Flipper for that. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's just portrayed in the wrong way. You mm -hmm. can also use technology that we used, like when Larry and I first started hanging out a lot in 2005 to do that way before we had flippers. Yep. You could use a laptop or you could use uh, microcontrollers or your phone or Raspberry Pis. Yep. But and all capable of doing that. And for the record, the politically correct term is machine in the middle now. Yeah. I'm trying to retrain my brain on that. Thank <laughs> you for hard. correcting it's me. Hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Yep. So, so I'm curious because I, I wasn't 
party to Bill's conversations previously about Flipper Zero. So, Bill, is your take that Flipper Zero is rather limited on RF capabilities? Uh, yeah, so that's that's a that's a great question. So yeah, my, my 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 intentions with that is that you know it's it's a tool, right? Like, it, and um, I, I think that it's the way that it's packaged in a way makes it um, a little bit more user friendly. Um, you know, we certainly, I, probably everybody here, uh, and, and probably everybody that, that's listening. Um, have you know have has said at one point in time, hey, look what I can do, right? That that really makes Flipper makes it really easy to to say, hey, hey, look what I can do, right? And 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 do and do bad things, right? That, but but by no means is it a a malicious, uh, you know. Only out for bad, only you know, only uh, a bad thing. It just uh, you know, it, it's it's packaged in a cute, you know, in a you know, a cute little thing that you can put in your pocket, and uh, you know, and I, I think that I think that's the reason why people when we start. So your word earlier that you said sensationalizing it, I think that I think it's easy to right. It's an it's an easy target to to sensationalize and. You know, it's been in the news ever since it was released, and you know, my, you know, so that that's how I think they they ended up banning it. And Mandy, I don't know if I answered your question there or not, but um, I, I I see it as purely as a tool, and it's a great teaching tool, right? It's something that I that I've purchased for for my children, right? I want them to learn and play with that with it, so they they yeah, can understand. Last week, to uh, kind of almost like a counterpoint, Bill, last week you covered a story that um, with the NRF uh, module, you can use it to do mouse jacking. Now, mouse jacking is a 2016 call. They want their uh, attack back. However, it still works. It still works because folks still have wireless mice and keyboards that are vulnerable to this attack where you can essentially inject a DocuScript or DocuScript payload over your, um, it's not Bluetooth, it's just 2.4 gigahertz, the yep. NRF24 modules that you can get. And there's many, many different options for that. Plug into your flipper, um, allow you to do that. And there's software in the flipper, uh, in the flipper firmware to, to do yep. that. And they use that on a pen test to actually successfully inject a payload. And like, why not use the tool? Like, cool, I get my NRF24, I've got a flipper zero. This one had an antenna, you know, extension on it. and. Off to the races. Yeah, like, cool. And, and, and I think to Bill's point, it's it's a it's a toy, but it is a great learning tool mm -hmm. in that it can you know, really help folks. Uh, so, uh, with the wireless portion of the device itself is pretty limited, but you can add on to it. And mm. I think adding that the the Nordic NRF twenty four is is a great example of that. I mean, I talked about doing those attacks with the Nordic NRF twenty four connected to your laptop under Linux mm -hmm. at the DefCon Wireless Village, like. 2016-ish time frame. Probably. Yeah, yeah, like it feels like a decade ago because yeah. that's probably what it was eight to ten years ago. Mm -hmm. But now, like that took like you know a week to get stuff compiled and figured out what you needed to do and flashing and you and but now you plug it in and you go and you've got the flipper zero and it works and now go do that. But, but I like that it's, it's highlighting dive. this issue. The deep, it's highlighting this issue dive. too as it becomes easier. Folks are doing it on pen test. <clears throat> yep. The, the public service announcement is you really got to go find your older gear <laughs> that's vulnerable to this and get it and get it replaced or update the firmware on it if it can be updated. Yep. I'm not sure if I said that last week or not or if we covered that story. Sam, do you remember if we covered that story last week? It, they all blur together, right? Yeah. <laughs> Did you have one's been around for weeks? Uh, also, but, but uh, Bluetooth related, and I'm not sure if, sto if your story number eight, Sam, is also Bluetooth. Uh, related doesn't appear on the surface, but I think we also talked about locks last week. I've got another story about Bluetooth locks. Uh, which story is it? Uh, no, it's not that one. It's not that one. It is uh, not that one. Hold on, I'll, I'll find it. Nope. Not oh, that yeah, one. it's my story number twenty. More digital locks are under attack. There's a ton of details here that I basically flagged. Because I was like, I'm going to go read this. I can't read this now because uh, I'm running short on time for the show and I hadn't gone back and read it. I'm like, there's a ton of details here. But I also saved these of like, if I need a reference for something, like I can go back to it and I have it. 
So this is like a save this for later kind of thing because there's interesting research in here. Um, but uh, and so basically it's tips and tricks for other research you might need to do. But also it's kind of interesting that <clears throat> locks are coming under attack, especially in the case of last week and this week, two different pieces of research attacking uh, digital locks with some kind of RF technology. I think they both were Bluetooth low energy, uh, to be honest, Larry. Yep. But well, your story number eight, is this, is this RF or is this? My story number eight. Uh, sorry, Sam's story number oh, eight. Oh, sorry, Sam's yeah. story number eight. This one is not technical at all. This is the same old problem that's been going around forever. There are intentional manufacturer reset codes in the lock. In fact, I got a uh, electronic lock years ago, stuck it in the lab, and I told students they could have extra credit if they picked it, and they immediately picked it because there was a secret backdoor code they figured out I didn't. The 0000 would open it. Oh. And these have similar backdoor reset codes that they don't tell the customer about. Interesting. Mm. So it's a backdoor. It's so a backdoor. It's a backdoor. Backdoors door. are not secrets, Mr. Potato Head. Not, Mr. Potato Head. Backdoors are not secrets. Know. Yeah. Mm hmm. Sweet. All right. That's our lock coverage uh, for this week. <laughs> uh, we I have more... kind of a, a Go ahead. related. Go ahead, Mandy. Sorry. I don't know if I've said it on this one before about the house my parents owned in northern Las Vegas that had previously been owned by Willie Nelson. No. And in redoing the carpet, found the safe in the pad, like in the, the foundation pad, uh -huh. and picked it that way. And what what they find? Nothing. It was oh. empty. Damn. He cleaned out all his weed out of yeah, there before say, he left. Keep your, you, put your, you put your weed down. <laughs> he didn't really think he was going to leave it behind, I guess. <laughs> put your weed in there. I mean, it was no, empty, it, but it smelled like skunk. <laughs> 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 oh boy uh, Larry, We had more Bluetooth stuff and uh, We did So there was It was interesting There was three Pieces of Research I'll call it On Bluetooth um, One is the Scalable Bluetooth Low Energy Survey That is uh, Kind of an implementation Of Xenokova's research That he presented at ShmooCon uh, This year That he had developed uh, The previous year Which is like a ton Of of stuff to consume. Then there's um, bad Bluetooth hit attacks that are in Kali NetHunter, uh, yep. which is the mobile um, uh, version of, of Kali. Yep, and, uh, and I'll also uh, for the re so for the record, the first one uh, from Gray Noise mm. is the uh, Radagata. Uh, the Bluetooth low energy survey tools on some very small standalone hardware, um, including the M5 stack stuff. That, yeah, I saw that, the M5 uh, stack. So I was Axon excited. had been doing a ton of work on, and you know we've played with uh, a little bit. So basically, building a Bluetooth low energy sensor network mm -hmm. so you can track devices. Uh, Kelly NetHunter, the bad Bluetooth hit attacks. Uh, we talked about those Bluetooth keyboard injection attacks not all that long yeah. ago. So this is Ducky Script <laughs> through a Bluetooth uh, hit. Yep, without right? without authentic because there was some bypasses and some overflows and that type of stuff there. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, I tested some of them and did get some of them to work, mm -hmm. uh, specifically against the iPhone and I think an Android device as well. Oh, and this was research that came out fairly recently too. Yes. Yes, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was the guy that discovered the mouse jacking that also did this one? I, I if, believe, if yeah. I remember, I if I remember yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. It's, been, it's been five or six weeks or so since that. We yeah. covered that story, but yeah. now seeing some easy implementation of some of the stuff and things that folks are using. Right. And your and level the, of the, difficulty for net under <laughs> depends on which phone you're trying to put it on. Right. Speaking from experience. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and then the final Bluetooth one uh, was the Reggaeton Be Gone. Yeah. This is perhaps the most fun one. Like, yep. this is... Yes. You know what, Bill? I was going to bring that up. Bill, this is, <laughs> this is total shenanigans, dude. This is like the embodiment of but, hacking shenanigans, and the, the, right? and the the way that the shenanigans happened were, were just unbelievable. So apparently, the story is that this is something Bill would do. Uh, by the way, this Ron, is totally like I oh, feel yeah. like they stole this from your brain, Bill. Yeah. So the uh, Ronnie ben Ronnie Bandini, the what is on the GitHub repository, uh, apparently had a neighbor that had a Bluetooth speaker, and they'd be um, be playing lots of reggaeton, which he didn't particularly care for and they would play it often and at quite loud volumes and it was just annoying um determined that it was coming out of a bluetooth speaker so he found some ways 
to uh, perform effectively denial of service attacks against the Bluetooth speaker anytime reggaeton music came on. And there's two parts that I find amazing about this. One, um, <laughs> there were three attacks listed in the tool. The third one, um, he did not release uh, as part of the tool. It's likely because maybe they're doing coordinated disclosure or something of the like again for this attack. Uh, the other one was some uh, flooding of just data to the speaker, cause it to stop, to start disconnecting. And in many cases, the Bluetooth low energy devices are basically single threaded. So you can only have one user connect at a time. So he just went and connected to the speaker and now the, the, the neighbor would disconnect from the speaker. Yeah, so I read the source code uh, to this. And when he, the code, when it finds the target Bluetooth address, it calls the uh, function that performs the actual attack to yep. disrupt the Bluetooth speaker. Now, method one, so we've got three methods in there. Method one is like a gentle, almost like ping. Yep. Like small, he calls it in the comments, small are you there. Method two is like medium, like, hey, I think you should pay attention to me kind of thing. Yep. He's using L2 ping to what it looks like essentially flood it is my interpretation. Yep. Method three in the comments says this is the extra, extra large attack, and the quote is, say hello to my little friend, Yep. Uh, which if you notice the Scarface poster behind Omkar in the previous <laughs> segment, it's pretty yeah. funny. Yep. So he says, mm -hmm. um, all this method does is print, sorry, the Scarface method is not included in this version. Right. So he's got some other way to disrupt a Bluetooth device that yep. he did not want that, to release. That's, like, that's likely the, hey, I'm keeping this for myself, <laughs> mm -hmm. or... I'm trying to work out with the manufacturer so that they can get this resolved and doing responsible disclosure. Well, or, well I know. Go ahead, Bill. I know what I'm doing this weekend, boys, <laughs> right? So, like, let, let's build these <laughs> things, get them out on Tendi, and figure out uh, the uh, the method number three, right? <clears> so, then you can, then you can put it on the flipper and we'll be all set. Right, right, right. absolutely. Now, I think that if I, if I remember correctly, this was the story that the, was the part that blew my mind about it was that it used AI to listen to the music. To figure out what kind of music it was. To figure out what kind of music it was first. So if it's not reggaeton, reggaeton, Go ahead. reggaeton? reggaeton. Totally yeah. fine. Go, totally fine. But if reggaeton came on, oh, hey, that's reggaeton. <laughs> yeah, but you need to notice he had to train his own model. Mm. Oh, there was course. nothing existing for reggaeton. Of course. <laughs> so he trained his own model to detect the reggaeton first. Yep. What a nerd. It's amazing. <laughs> you say that, Bill, but I told you, this is like a page right out of your brain. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I absolutely love this. Like, I've already started the, uh, you know, started the repo, <laughs> right? Like, like haven't this even was, run the code yet. I, but I if love this it was, already. If this was 15 years ago, this is the kind of stuff that would show up on i-hack.com. Like, a thousand percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Uh, I, I love training the, uh, the, the models. Uh, a friend of mine... Uh, sent over um, uh, on um, uh, uh, chat AI uh, LLM that they're working on to provide security advice and this type of stuff. And uh, they sent me a message a couple of days later and said, hey, why don't you ask it to play a game? And it'll play security-based games with you. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. And of course, I asked it to play a game. How did I ask it to play a game? Shall we play a game? Mm -hmm. And sure, how about this? And then my answer was, how about we play... Global, Global thermonuclear, thermonuclear war. war. Of course. And they, it came back and said, how about a nice game of chess instead? Uh, yes. And I said, <laughs> yes. no, I really want to play Global Thermonuclear <laughs> War. <laughs> and, of course, it came back with, you know, I really appreciate the whole War Games references. But, you know, as an ethical LLM, I'm not going to play games of world destruction. <laughs> but, it's amazing. Yes. That, is the, that is the second War Games reference in this segment if you're yes. playing along at home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we, Sam, uh, both had stories about <clears throat> VMware sandbox escape bugs, as well as Microsoft Hyper-V also had a guest to host uh, escape bug as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, that is my story number. Uh, I'll, I'll find it. I'll find it. It's coming to me. Uh, no, that's your, not it. Your that's story it. number 22? Uh, yeah, story number 22. Yes, uh, Microsoft fixes critical Windows Hyper-V flaws uh, is the link that I have, and also VMware has some as well. Yep, and Sam's story number two. Yeah, well, this is, uh, you know, this is something I've been worried about because I train all my students to analyze malware in virtual machines. 
Yep. And they say, it can't get out of there, can it? And I said, well, you know, well, the chance small. You don't have to worry about it. You'll, you won't run across that stuff. And I know I'm not so sure. Well, and, you know, that's a great point, Sam, because a lot of the things that are being said about uh, VM escape in general, based on these two stories recently, are, well, it, you know, they always caveat it with, well, the attacker has to be inside a guest virtual machine uh -huh. in order to execute this attack to get to the host. Uh -huh. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Like, you ever, but you that, ever, but you ever downloaded Kali and run it in a VM? Right. But exactly. But I mean, I'm like, in this this is the 90s, or early 2000s, where like unauthenticated remote code execution <laughs> was just running rampant yeah. on every system. Like that's the threat that we were dealing, dealing with, with primarily because it really sucked that there was a bunch of stuff hanging out on the network or the internet that was vulnerable to unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerabilities in a lot of operating systems and applications. But like, thankfully... Like, largely that attack landscape and threat landscape, vulnerability landscape, shifted, whereas yep. that's much less of the case today. So when we talk about threats, it's, well, yeah, the attacker has gained some level of, of privilege or uh, entrance or access to something, and then now you've got to defend it. Yeah. Like, just because you think, like, well, people, no one would get access, no one would be in my side, my VM. Like, well, where'd you get your VM image? Did you validate everything that was in your VM image? Maybe someone's already in there. Mm. I mean, the, the hashes matched what were in the repo. Right. Or to Sam's point, which I love, is in it, like, I'm putting something <laughs> that is malicious inside of my VM and hoping yeah. that it stays there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So these are, these are concerning and, and need to be uh, addressed. But I think VMware did a good job of going, yeah, even in end of life products, we're going to fix this vulnerability. But a bunch of people are freaking out about VMware now because of the Broadcom purchase. Yep. And mm -hmm. that they're doing an absolute train wreck of deprecating products and no more ESXi and, and yeah. So do we know if they're going to take away VMware Fusion Player and VMware Workstation Player? Because those are the ones we use. Yeah, We don't know. But don't know. Writing's on yeah. the wall. I mean, but then again, what business do they have? They have the enterprise product after that, right? I don't actually understand their business model because VMware Workstation Player is free, and as far as I can tell, it offers you everything that a professional version where you pay more than 100 bucks has. Uh, you can't take snapshots. Right. People tell me you can do that now, but that's right. But I just live without them. I don't care. <laughs> and, <laughs> and does that, that does the, do they have a free version for Linux too? Or yeah. is... It, it is. I, I just I maintain I mean, a license I mean, for it's, it's, VMware for for Linux. Yeah, it's, just like, it's like for it's like player, and uh, those are time limited licenses, aren't they, Sam? They're like thirty days or something. No, no. The, the, get, you can get a thirty day trial license of the pro version, Got it. but you can just the free version. The free version is just free forever, and as far as I can tell, it's just fine. It's got everything you need. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, all I know is Sam is running malware in his VMs and not taking snapshots. That man is living on the edge. Right? On the well, edge. I mean, you just throw it away. Yeah. And you just throw it away. Yeah. Well, I only use wimpy malware. Mostly stuff I wrote myself these days. <laughs> but anyway. That's how you know there's no VM escapes until you code that in, right? So uh, you're good to go. In that respect, I am, yes. But sometimes students exceed my instructions and play games. I've gotten in trouble that way before. Oops. And they wander into like the public lab and start doing the malware projects. One student came home, came to class and said, well, I was doing my homework last night, but I was doing it at work. And I said, you were? And I said, where do you work? He said, at a bank. And I said, oh, this is sounding bad. He said, yeah, as soon as I loaded up uh, these hacking tools, the phone rings. And they say, what's wrong with you? Knock it off. Mm -hmm. I said, well, good. That's what they should be doing. And, right. and, it, and it worked. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Well, I mean, at least VMware has gone back in this case and patched end-of-life products, which is more yeah. than we can say for D-Link. Because there have been at least two D-Link vulnerabilities and associated exploits, my story number four, <clears throat> where researchers have created an exploit. Uh, I think this one happens to be uh, for a buffer overflow. If this is the one I'm thinking of, it was a buffer overflow in their username field of Telnet, uh, was one of them. 
<laughs> well, this tells so, you the age uh, of the router. Tell this one, enabled. Yeah. This, right? This one was uh, HNAP, uh, Home Network Administration Protocol. Mm. So I've observed at least two uh, exploits. I don't, in the wild is the, the wrong way to say it. The exploits exist. I don't know if people are using them or not. And if people were, how would you know? But in both cases, D-Link is like, well, those are an end-of-life products and our advice to the customer is to buy a new router. Like, oh, really? How, how nice of you. How quaint. Yeah, that's just wonderful. And you're just enabling like the next generation of the Mirai-based variant botnet and to be created because these things are out there. And if the users haven't replaced them by now, they're probably not going to until it breaks. Yep. And who knows? Maybe Mirai and these things will cause issues and then be like, oh, that router's trash. I'm going to buy a new one. <laughs> we can only hope, right? Yeah, but there's no other real, like, workarounds. <clears throat> Although, as I say that, you, you could disable some of these services. But in my experience with a lot of these IoT-based routers... Uh, you can't disable a lot of these. Sir, I mean, unless you're okay, it's very hard to disable. Like, there's no user land facility in the interface to go. I want to disable Telnet. I want to disable HNAP. Like, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Yep. Also, typically in my experience, a firmware update will like re-enable those services. But I guess if there's no firmware updates for these, we don't have to worry about that particular scenario. Yep. I mean, the other scenario is you reverse engineer the firmware. You, like, pull it apart, customize it to disable these services, and then put it back together and flash it on the router, which I'm not recommending that you do, by the way. So if you break your router, don't send me an email and say, Paul, I break my router doing what I heard you do on the show. Because I'm telling you right now, you will, you will likely break your router. There's a high probability of, of breaking if you, do that, if you do that process. Yep. And just to get an idea, uh, I don't know for sure how old this router is. Yeah. Uh, That's actually DR... what I've been trying to research right now while yeah. we're talking but, about uh, it. A DR822 isn't old. So uh, I, I went to look at it and I didn't get a definitive answer, but there's a review at digitalcitizen.life uh, from 2018. So it's probably about the time mm -hmm. when it came out. So it's a it's a six year old home based Wi Fi router that only has ten megabit Ethernet and it's an AC twelve hundred, so it's not horrible. It's not ho well, yeah. But it's not great either. We we yeah, should start TV data. Oh, sorry, Bill, then Mandy. Sorry, sorry, Mandy. I, I'll go. So we should start teaching people that these things are disposable equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if it, if, the, if, your, if your home router was 100 bucks, let it run for two or three years and, you know, say that you got your money's worth and throw it away. Like, because this is just going to, this is going to be the, the gift that keeps on giving. The, these, these types of routers, I assume that, you know, just, just looking through these things, I imagine they've got hard-coded creds, they've got, you know, they, they've got, there's no no input sanitization on these things. I, I imagine that we'll continue to hear about flaws on these types of devices. And, and quite honestly, I mean, just kind of throwing it back to you guys, how long do you, would you expect D-Link to support mm. a router? Like, is it is it reasonable for them to support it for till the, the end of time? No. I see, but yeah. I, I <clears throat> this is one reason why I like Ubiquity. Um, you pay more. <clears throat> up front, but they tend to give you firmware updates for a really long time. I don't have any like scientific evidence, but I know I've had, I've been maintaining Ubiquity routers for like a really long time. And even sometimes I go into the interface and I'm like, oh, there's a firmware update. I'm like, that's one of my really old access points that like I'm getting ready to, <clears throat> you know, get rid of, but like it's in the garage. So stuff can get, <clears throat> you know, better Wi-Fi in the garage. Um, but you know, I think you get you get better uh, better support for longer if you pay a little more upfront. And Ubiquity's been pretty good about that. I don't know what your experience is, Larry. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> agreed, agreed. So they're saying that it's deprecated. Mm -hmm. But this hardware revision will no longer receive firmware updates after the end of support date, which is March 29th, 2024. It has not yet. Interesting. Because I literally was just going to see, hey, can I get firmware for this from D-Link's website? And I, because you were saying that it's end of life and they're not doing support for it and they're not doing a patch, I went to their legacy site and I couldn't find it on the legacy site. So I'm like, well, is it in standard production? Yes. Yes, it is. It's on their non-legacy site. 
And it literally says the DIR US version, uh, March 29th is hmm. the last. Hmm. There are ways to acquire set. Well, so what I've noticed is. I now have firmware. Yeah, like a, a lot of these router manufacturers will not distribute older firmware. They tend to take it down. Unless you have friends that maybe <laughs> have a copy of said, scraped said, said firmware. firmware or scraped it or found it on an open S3 bucket or, you know. <clears throat> and if you are one of those friends and you have repositories of firmware for yes. stuff. You collect that. Because I'm thinking, some beer. what if we analyze all the firmware of D-Link routers that are end of life? Well, we, I mean, that's what these security researchers are doing. Yep. You could totally run it through Emba. Now I know I'm doing this weekend. Um, <laughs> but I had a story on that uh, about, uh, it was in the gray noise, um, story number 18. And they're looking at Fortinet. And so this is a, a slightly different scenario, right? This is a much more enterprise um, uh, grade and enterprise company selling to enterprises, right? Um, so they were looking to do a patch diff because uh, Fortinet comes out with a new vulnerability, so they want to do a patch diff. So we look at current firmware versus previous firmware. Um, but they say finding these versions and decrypting them is going to be the first battle. So oh, now there's a big difference in what I just stated, right, is typically from these larger manufacturers, the firmware is encrypted. And so you got to figure out how to decrypt it in order to analyze it, in order to do, in this case, what they were doing is a patch diff, right? So he says, I was lucky enough to bypass that via the power of friendship. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> I'll let your imagination run wild. We got, we got, we got friends, right? Um, so, but he says, if your friendship is lacking and won't be able to get lucky and find the files they need on Grey Hat Warfare, which is a repository of open S3 and other kind of uh, buckets, which is limited. Um, but like, if you know what you're searching for, I know people like my friend Bob that have found firmware on there uh, to be analyzed for all kinds of weird uh, devices and the ability to like go back in previous uh, versions. So I've been down this road. It's a lot of fun and it can also be like really frustrating. Yeah. So Paul, you say you're mm. going to spend some time with that firmware um, with Emba this weekend. Yes. I happen to work for a company that does firmware analysis, and I already uploaded it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Uh, you can share said, said it's results. Pro it's processing, yeah. <laughs> it's processing as we speak. It's processing <laughs> as we speak. Nice. Yep. All right, what else we got? Well, maybe we should follow up on the discussion we had months ago about Elon Musk, because I was delighted to see, you know, he sued OpenAI, claiming that their emails were a contract. So they replied back by releasing his emails. And I know you're gonna be shocked and horrified by this, but his claims that he was blocking the development of AI and leaving open AI to protest because they were being irresponsible and gonna bring about the end of mankind was all nonsense. He demanded control of the company so he could have all the money mm. and then cut off his funding to starve them into agreeing to it. And then they found funding somewhere else. And that's why he rage quit and walked out. Ah. Well, and so, there you have so, it. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. The cynical position was apparently the correct one. <laughs> no. Yeah. And there's another one. You look at my story number seven, which is the cover story in the front page of New York Times. I mean, I remember many years ago, I got these mailers saying, if you attach this surveillance mm. device to your car, you can get cheap insurance because oh, it will yeah. monitor. And I thought, well, I might do that, but my car is so old, it wasn't compatible with the surveillance device. But now it turns out they're just doing that without telling you. The Cars, these smart cars that people are driving are automatically uploading that data, selling it to Lexus, Nessus, that resells it to insurance companies, and then they change your, your policy based on how they like your driving. So, and I realized I've been watching commercials on Amazon Prime advertising this feature. They show a picture of some guy driving calmly and some other guy driving like a lunatic, and they say, we're a nice insurance company. We base our rate on your real driving, not on those lunatics. Mm. Mm -hmm. You'd say that privacy is dead. Get, long, pr long, privacy is dead. Long live privacy. Do you yep, get? Yep. Do you, but do you get points if you win the race, though? I mean, that's. 
You know, I mean, I mean you should. I think you should. Because right? you didn't crash. Like in if the you process. win the race and you don't crash, <clears throat> like well, I did, like, like I did the other yeah. day, I think you should get points for that. You, you won the race or did you, you crashed? I won the race and I did not crash. Okay, okay. That's good. Uh, but you, but you lose because your insurance rate will go up. Probably. I don't know. I own a Tesla, so my insurance rate's already through the roof. <laughs> but mm-hmm. a lot of that is is based on the cost of the parts too, not necessarily many other. Fa- I mean, it is other factors, but I'm told in unscientific research that a lot of it is based on how expensive the parts are. For well, them. yeah, I think Hertz and electric cars because they said the maintenance cost turned out to be too high. Yeah. Yeah. What was that, Bill? I was going to say, and the fact that that Tesla is stolen. Right. With a flipper zero. <laughs> right. Yeah. By right. Bill. By yeah. Bill. No, Paul did that one. Paul taught me how to steal Teslas. I, I, I insure flippers. all of my stolen Teslas. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Bill, on the, in the, on the converse, you're going to yeah. teach Paul how to steal hats. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, one of the things in the last conversation, we ran out of time, but I was going to ask him if he had any nice hats and if I could just... <laughs> You know, try one on, see if it fit. But, yeah, then walk uh, away. We, with we, it. we we ran out of time. You learned stealing from uh, Putin and stealing the Super Bowl ring from Bob Kraft. <laughs> you remember that whole thing? I had forgotten about that. Now I was watching the the dynasty, and that's totally exactly the scenario you described. Putin's like, "Hey, can I try in the ring?" He's like, yeah, he's like, I could kill someone with this ring, was what he said. It was like, whoa. And then he put it in his pocket and walked away with a Super Bowl ring. Wow. <clears throat> Craziness. Mr. Putin, that was not a gift. No. Well, it was. Because then the White House called Kraft and was like, yeah, if you could just like, let him get away with that to improve relations, that'd be great. Well, we'll, get, we'll get you another one. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't think they said that. <laughs> don't, don't worry, you'll get a couple more. And there. That's true. We probably did get a couple more after all that transpired. So. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> and now the conspiracy theorists. That's right. Yeah. Oh, so Microsoft confirms that Russian spies stole source code. Speaking of Russia. Oh, I had the story. <coughs> I had the story in for last week, and I wasn't here, and I deleted it because, well. So we all know about the the shenanigans that have been happening uh, in the recent source code, but like. My whole thing, and this was discussed on the Daily Dave. Um, remember the Daily Dave mailing list? I do. List? Still some posts that, that happened there. Um, so when I saw the story, I remember seeing the Daily Dave kind of talking about, does it matter if the source code is leaked? Like, what is, who benefits from that and how much and why? Well, did you leave secrets in the source code for one thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> does the source code reveal uh, possible poor programming practices? I think that's, all, that's a whole lot of alliteration right there. I think all source code does. Okay. <laughs> right. And can any of these poor programming practices be purloined to promote? Sorry. <sighs> Got to stop with the alliteration. Uh, can, can you find any bugs that are potentially exploitable? More easily than you could without the source code, right? Exactly. That's the debate we have versus, yep. you know, static yep. versus binary analysis. Yep. Which, which, is, which is better? I mean, the answer is it depends. The, the I answer think, is like yes. Largely, yeah. the answer is yeah. do, do both. Right, right. Well, you know, the question is: is the developer actually scanning their code for vulnerabilities? No, I would assume at Microsoft that yeah. they are. Right? Yes, I, yes. I'm not sure exactly how or what that process looks like, but I gotta <laughs> imagine largest software company in the world. I forget there's there's some statistic of how many lines of code are written every single day at Microsoft. Like it's a lot, a yeah. lot. And uh, and that said, uh, GitHub is now a heavy. Uh, sorry, Microsoft is now a heavy user of GitHub. Mm-hmm. Uh, and GitHub pre-commit actions, uh, you can actually have the GitHub pre-commit actions. Uh, Prohibit the use of traditionally vulnerable functions like right. st- string copy and and mem copy and so forth, and will prevent you from committing code that uses those functions. Mm-hmm. And in fact, they have GitHub actually has a list of uh, prohibited C based functions that you're not allowed to use as part of the GitHub development stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, and yet, Patch cool. Tuesday still exists, right? So, I mean, like, <laughs> right? there's still a lot of patches that come out every single month. Like, that, yep. the, the Microsoft code base is so tremendous. And, and just over the years, we've seen just the, the reuse of code that, go, that has, 
you know, that, that has types all the way back to like Windows 3.1 or whatever, right? Like, yeah. you, you know that that code, like if it, if that source code, finding finding and develop, developing exploits for Windows would be a lot easier if you had the source code available, right? Like totally. The end. Well, yeah. you, but don't forget, Bill, you have to, I'll take the counterpoint on that. You have to be able to analyze all of that source code. And this is not like just tens of thousands of lines in a particular project that's open source on GitHub. This is Windows, <laughs> millions of lines of code. And what the, the Daily Dave post, uh, someone responded, uh, essentially, actually, Michael Zawesky uh, is the one to respond. It was like, basically, like, Static code analysis like gets really hard when you're talking millions and millions of lines yeah, of code and, and potential for fa lots of false positives. And, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've got to have a lot more context around how things are done as opposed to just calling out specific functions. And yeah, you can go look for specific functions, but then you got to validate. Yep. Because you, you, really... you have to understand the context. Correct. Correct. Right. Uh, so, or more importantly, AI needs to understand the context. Yeah. Even, <laughs> even at that, I mean, potentially, uh, <clears throat> there's gonna be a lot of cycles there, but, uh, Emba does some of this, right. And it just, it looks at particular code patterns and there's a lot of faults, but like, so let's say you're analyzing firmware and the web management interface is written in PHP it will analyze said PHP and run like semgrep rules against it. But again, you could, then you've got to go through all that stuff. And again, this is in a web management interface on firmware, which is typically pretty small. Yep. And you get like, oh, there was 1,400 vulnerabilities in the PHP code that we found, you know, with semgrep. Yep. Well, you know, I've been um, testing static code analyzers for a secure coding class. Mm. And I took them all, and they were all pretty much garbage except for SNCC. Yeah, as what see, which is says it's AI enhanced and it'll fix your code with AI. So I ran it, and it was really good at finding the vulnerabilities. But the only thing it could fix with AI was like in the main config file when you have old versions of libraries using version one, it'll say AI says change that to version two. Mm -hmm. That's all the AI. Do. Mm. So, yeah, and that, so, that's been around for. I mean, if you have a commercial static analyzer, that that's been around forever. Yeah. So, so I don't see the AI benefiting us here, here yet. But yeah. does does Sneak have a an open uh, freely available open source thing? Uh, well, I think I've used some of their stuff it's, before. Yeah, the one I use is free and it's very powerful. It's the one I'm going to recommend to my students. We're going to nice. patch uh, bugs in the OWASP juice shop. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Is, that, is is Alyssa Miller still there? I don't think she is anymore. Uh, I don't think so. I think she was. I think when she was, I want to say, did I interview when she worked there? Were they yep. a sponsor back in the, she, back in the you, day? She was on the show when she worked there. Yeah, I think it was a sponsored interview. Their stuff, their stuff is pretty cool. I've used some of their stuff uh, before. Yeah, well, it's a great product. It's the only one I could find that's free and also worth much of anything. And you tested uh, Semgrep and uh, what's the other yeah. one? There's another like pure open source one. Similar to uh, Semgrep. I can't remember the name of it now. Oh, Sam, you went away for a second. I'll check. Take me a minute. Yeah, what are some of the elements you look, you look at? I'm curious now because there's... Okay, I used um, Code AC, mm -hmm. uh, Semgrep, and SonarCube. SonarCube, yep. yeah. Sonar, SonarCube is really hard to set up and had really miserable results. Um, the only one worth anything was SNCC. It made all the others seem useless. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, did you see my story number seven? Researchers expose Microsoft SCCM misconfigurations usable in cyber attacks. Say that one more time. So your well, story number. My story number seven. So what I liked about this one was um, not only are they highlighting the problem. So the researchers gave a presentation at a conference and they were like, look, we're pwning stuff because people are misconfiguring SCCM. And rather than just going on the typical, hey, look, we can pwn stuff, isn't, isn't this fun? They were like, all right, so we're gonna put up this website. We're gonna give everyone like this huge matrix of, here are all the different misconfigurations that we're abusing. Here's the definition of them all, and here's some advice as to how to fix uh, all of them. So I loved that about this, because they put together a whole database and so I started perusing through the database, <clears throat> and 
like I think they kind of looked at it as like uh, a progression in like the stack of how SCCM is used. And very early on <clears throat> in SCCM, it was like, well, you can use Pixie. And so like you can Pixie boot and tie it into SCCM. Um, and they're like, there's attacks. I didn't, I didn't realize there were these attacks. So basically if you can attack Pixie and they talk about the, you know, DHCP race conditions and all that stuff in Pixie that we've been talking about mm -hmm. with, with Pixie fail and, and UEFI. Um, if an attacker can basically pull that apart, they can get to the part where they can pull down an image from SCCM. That's like the operating system install image. And apparently there's different ways to uh, encrypt that and protect it. So one is like you can just leave it open. You know, like if it's open, then you can analyze the image and you can pull stuff out of that. So you may be able to recover domain credentials from analyzing the image that's being uh, managed and installed on systems via SCCM with the help of Pixie. They're like, if it is encrypted, there's ways around that. So it's a weak password. You can also use, I believe it's Hashcat uh, to crack that password on that image. I didn't, there's Python tools available. I put the link to the GitHub uh, for this particular, they call it cred one uh, technique, uh, attack technique. And they have all the links to the resources in there. I'm like, huh. some of these tools are pretty new, like five, five months old. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I didn't realize that was, that was a thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, SCCM is, is an amazing target for mm -hmm. going after the enterprise because it <clears throat> typically you're, you're using that to control your group policy and deploy software and, and yep. like, and if you can, if you can control the spice, you can control the universe, right? So if you can control <laughs> SCCM, you can control everything in the. In it was not a war games uh, reference. It was a Dune reference. Was, but you know, that's, that's right? good. That's good. Good. If you're playing <laughs> along at home, movie references. There you yep. go. There's the third one. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I, <clears throat> go ahead, About uh, canary tokens. Um, number twelve. That was pretty shocked. I've been recommending these things for years, and it never occurred to me to have an injection vulnerability. It was a really cool uh, attack, right, against uh, Canary tokens. It was yeah. inside the user agent string, you could put a command, and then when you exported the logs from all your Canary tokens into a CSV, you load that CSV into a Microsoft uh, Excel application, and that command was executed. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah. That was the, I was like, that's, I, I like that. Like, yeah. Hat tip. Stored Love injection. it. It's just like exploits of a mom, the XKCD. Stored injection. Mm -hmm. yep. the stored data. It's a, yeah. Uh, yep. yeah. Stored the, command injection this, is a good way to describe this that. This reminds me of one of the uh, uh, attacks that... Uh, Iron Geek theorized about many, many years ago about using a barcode to drop uh, cross-site scripting at the grocery store. So you put barcodes on a bunch of products in the grocery store, they get scanned at the register and they go bloop, and the, and the register is like, I'm, I know DOS, I don't know what the hell this is all about, but it ends up in the log, and then at the end of the shift, the, uh, the store manager goes and reviews all of their logs with Internet Explorer in, in the office, and in the log entry is this cross-site scripting that had this error that they're reviewing all the errors for like, hey, this barcode was scanned and it wasn't in the database, somebody forgot to inventory something. Mm. Yeah, it's it wasn't in the inventory because it's cross-site scripting, and then their browser gets exploited. Like, well, I mean that mm. that goes back to like log for J too, yep, right? Exactly. I mean that was that was a that was a big thing for for a long time. Being able to inject strings into logs, attacking the interpreter for logs is you know is a mm -hmm. is a novel and interesting and fun attack, right? Um, and, and but you know, and and I so I did read this one, Paul. That this was a you know, th this was a was a good this was a good story, but I would still recommend people use canary tokens. So mm -hmm. Sam, like you you mentioned, like you know you've been you've been recommending those for years. Um, yeah. You know this was this was a this was a clever attack, right? This was uh, you know it, it it's novel, it's clever, it's funny, right? Uh, it, but I, I assume it's fixed and doesn't change my approach of of using canary tokens anywhere, right? No, absolutely. I mean, there's there's so many people get hacked and they don't know it, and you could so easily know it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course the team at, at Thinks uh, fixed this issue, right? Like obviously, 
solid team there with a, a long story. Yeah, what's, story what's cool history. about yeah. Canary, you know, what, what's cool about them as a company uh, is, you know, that, that they make a lot of the, a lot of their content is just, just free, right? Like you can um, just, uh, you know, just that there are, there are ways to, to download, um, j- download, um, you know, Canary documents, um, images, th- those kind of things, and, and still be able to u- utilize their mapping software. It's 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 a very very oh, cool service. At, right? and it, at some point this year, uh, in one of our like vault uh, things, I did an interview series called Hacker Heroes that's releasing on uh, kind of our off weeks this year. I did a one on one sit down hour plus long interview with Haroon Mir, uh, and we nice. talked about like that free model. Uh, you get the whole history, uh, you know, behind things and b- behind Canary and all that stuff and how a lot of these things came to be and kind of like his trial and error of like what's going to work in me building uh, a company. And like based on that is, is how we have today what is things and the, the free offerings in, in Canary tokens. Cool. <clears throat> um, I, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I, I sort of wonder what you guys think of my story number three. These guys looked at underground cybercrime ads, and they're convinced that real security professionals are taking night jobs to perform crimes I mean, because uh, they aren't making money. Do you believe uh, this is really happening to any significant extent? Well, I mean, Sam, you're writing your own malware, right, to do VM escape. <laughs> I heard that earlier, I thought, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm writing really lame malware. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but, you know, how, how many people would really do that? You know, have a, have a legit job and then be a black hat by night. It seems like you'd have to be really stupid to do that. Yeah, I, I, I think you're looking at it. I think you need to look at it the inverse, right? The the inverse is how you look at that, Sam, is, is say like, okay, how many cyber crime, uh, like criminals, like so, and I don't, you know, like let's call them criminals. How many of them have day jobs, right? Like if you think about it that way, right? Like I would imagine that there's a high percentage, right? I mean, like, that, Cybercrime at night, right? But I, you know, I still got to have dental. Well, I, I actually be in contact with quite a few of these people around 2011, 2012. The criminals would talk to me, and I would sort of encourage them to go straight, you know, get a real job and knock this off. Uh, this one really grinds my gears. Uh, I've heard. Nancy Lohan. Yeah, I've heard really like uh, I've heard stories, and I've seen it come to light when <clears throat> an investigation happens. Who's behind this particular attack? Who's the criminal? And they end up being someone who works in cybersecurity. And the one that, like, I think maybe pisses me off the most was a Darknet Diaries episode, I believe, where they talked about, I believe it was extortion of Instagram accounts and Twitter accounts and the sending of the pizzas. To people, you guys remember that one? Sounds familiar. So you've got a <laughs> you've got a three letter Twitter handle or an English word Instagram name. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's forums on there on the internet where you can, if you acquire one of these accounts, you can basically go resell it. And so, like these people were being essentially harassed. Uh, text messages. They were sending pizzas like repeatedly. Uh, you know, COD to the people's homes. Uh, in certain cases, there was swatting involved in other type shenanigans. I've also heard it where they send, uh, like the U.S. Postal Service, you can order like a whole bunch of boxes and they'll, yep. they'll send them to free, for free. And they send it to like this kid's house. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to have to explain to his parents that he was involved in like the, this hacking stuff. So this one wasn't as innocent, like he was involved with the wrong people and they started harassing him and he was like trying to get rid of the boxes kind of thing. Uh, but in like at least one of these cases that I remember, it turned out to be someone who worked in, in cybersecurity that was doing some of these attacks and profiting. So to go back to your point, Sam, I hate it when this happens. Like, I feel like we should police our own, but like we, we can't be the moral authority on every single cybersecurity person. We can sit here and say, yes, you should act in a moral and ethical manner, but of course, you know, we can say that, but it's, but, you know, but people are going to be bad. I mean, it seems incredible that the people would do this because you ruin your reputation. Yep. And there, mm. you have so many good paying jobs available anyway. It doesn't really make any sense to pollute your name by doing this stuff. Well, I mean, <clears throat> arguably there's this, you know, I'm a cybersecurity professional. I'm not going to get caught. I know what I'm doing. 
is probably a little uh, bit of that too. I'm mm -hmm. invincible. They always think they're so lead. Every criminal thinks the cops are dumb and they're smart, you know, yep. until they change your mind about that. I have a story about that when I worked at the university and I actually presented on this years and years ago, uh, 20 years ago. And it, I noticed that like my Solaris systems were being hacked. And uh, when I did the incident response in the forensics, I was like, you left your like what you dropped on this Unix server, Solaris, I'm like, you left your usernames and passwords to your FTP servers that are, you're using to distribute the uh, all your like toolkits on and, and store your stuff. I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. So I contacted law enforcement. I probably told the story on the show at least twice before. But like I contacted law enforcement and then my phone rings with an investigator from Italy um, and who ap actually uh, had a cybersecurity startup I think his name was Dario, uh, uh -huh. and I interviewed him and didn't realize that he was the person that called me on the phone because he worked for the Italian uh, like computer forensic squad at the time uh, and was like, hey, what do you got? We exchanged BGP keys, and I sent him what I had and like basically broke the case wide open, and then I started reading news articles. I don't know if they sent me the news articles that were like they prosecuted them and they went to jail, and it turned out to be systems administrators and IT people that were behind this particular uh, campaign. And they went to jail for like seven years. Hmm. So there, there's a real life case, Sam, of <laughs> legit people doing bad things that in that particular case happened to get caught. But I mean, they were, they were super sloppy. Like I didn't do anything extraordinary. Right? <laughs> it's right. just like, huh, that's kind of weird. Maybe I should send that to law enforcement. Yeah. Bill, is your audio any better? I don't know. I, yeah, like, sounds better. I, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Say something smart now. Oh. <laughs> well, if I put on the spot, everything I can come up with is dumb. So you know. that was the, that was arguably smart, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Set you. the bar. Thank Set the bar low. Yeah. Yep. Set the bar low. <laughs> Set the bar low, and he did. Uh, my story number sixteen was super interesting. Uh, I don't know if uh, you guys read this, but no. <clears throat> Badgerboard, a PLC black black backplane even network visibility module. This is from the team at, uh, at Talos. Talos. Essentially, and I didn't dig through like all the technical details, right? I kind of just like skimmed it to get the gist of what they were saying. But basically, your PLCs are plugged into a backplane and the backplane, like through some proprietary connector, and the backplane is what handles network communications. And so if you're uh, in ICS and you've got all your PLCs and they're plugged into a backplane, how do you do network monitoring? In my assessment in an OT environment, network monitoring is extremely important, right? Because typically you're dealing with devices that are very sensitive. You can't really like scan or put agents on them. So you have to fall back to the network to do this level of monitoring. And so the, the Talos team was like, well, how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, how do we give people visibility into this uh, particular environment? And created this really cool hardware module uh, in order to do that. And the thing that, in the tech, again, this is one like I flag and I put in like a certain folder, like if I ever need to reference research and I'm doing something like super weird, I, w I want this in, in, in my library. Um, but the thing that got me was they said PLC vendors have both the capability and the product expertise to create products that accomplish what the Badger board, what the, the kind of basically hacked hardware uh, and software they, they did, uh, they implemented. They said they just need to be pushed um, by their customers. So customers should demand, you can't drop off this what are we using in, in, in place of the term black box? Is there a more politically correct term uh, than black box? Uh, because zero, zero knowledge. Zero not so it's a zero. Zero knowledge pen test. Like a black box pen test would no. be a zero knowledge pen, okay. pen test. That's, but what I'm talking about is like a, oh. like a, I, yes. I get the appliance from the vendor that I bought it from. Got it's it. in a box and it's, and it's on my network and I don't have any visibility into it. I would typically refer to that as 
like the black, black box. a black okay. box on my network. I don't know that we have Pandora's one. box. I don't know, like unknown box. Unknown. Uh, there's got to be a better way to dis- there is. A better way to describe that. But you yeah. know what I'm driving at, right? Um, and so, but I also see this parallel. I, I can smell what, the, what you're putting down. You smell what I'm what I've been stepping in. Yep. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, but I, so PLCs in this type of gear is just one type. Also, I, I have this issue with the same thing with, and I'm not, I'm not picking on vendors. I'm going to just be clear, but this is like a, in, a problem we have in our industry. Vendors like F5, Fortinet, Avanti, all, all the Sonicwall, like the list could run on, Zixil, um, are making these what we call appliances. As an enterprise, I'm taking this, I'm putting them in an environment, and Right now, I like to largely just have to blindly trust that what's inside that box is is secure, is doesn't have any known exploitable vulnerabilities. And largely, those of us that are sitting on this show that lift up the covers on some of these things <laughs> and look under the hood, we're like, oh, oh, it's really bad under here. Like, don't, don't do that, right? Like a mechanic that lives up the hood and just a smoke pouring out, fluids leaking everywhere. Like, it's a bad scene. We're like, shut the hood. We're like, you, you just, you need a new car. Like, that's just what it's coming down to. Um, do they, it, I, 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 I mean, at least you'd expect them to give you S bombs. Do they no. even give you that? No, this but nope. this is the we'll talk about uh, Josh, with Josh Corman uh, next week. We'll touch on this as well, right? Like, there and he articulates this. Like he articulated this um, when I, I spoke with him earlier this week, extremely well. Like the three reasons why uh, companies don't want to provide an S bomb. So I'm going to let him explain that because I would when he explained it to me, I was blown away. I'm like, I have not heard it articulated that that well ever before. So tune in next week mm. uh, in, in, to get that. Um, but so my continuing issue that I have is that we have to extend this trust because we don't have this visibility. And S bomb is one type of uh, component or. I don't know what you call that. They, they provides me, it affords me the luxury of some vul- uh, visibility, visibility yep. in, in terms of an S-bomb, right? Now, there's also issues there. It has to be updated. There's yep. also uh, the regulations like the EU CRA yep. that say uh, that I don't know what the final result is going to be. And Josh is going to touch on this as well. But uh, they say you shouldn't, we can't buy stuff. And deliver, or you can't sell stuff to the EU that has known vulnerabilities. vulnerabilities right. That that might change, and that's going to be and clarified, that, I'm sure. Right. But and, and currently, the proposed penalties are uh, if you do sell stuff with known vulnerabilities, or you release stuff to the market that has known vulnerabilities, it's fifteen million dollars, or one point five to three percent of your sales or your of your that's, value. That's rough. Like, that's, so, rough. like that's not some you don't want to you want to don't want to screw that up. But going back to your, your earlier story, Larry, like if there's 1,500 vulnerabilities in the mm-hmm. S-bomb that you generate for, for OT gear, mm-hmm. like are all those exploitable? Are all those in, an immediate problem? In, do they pose an immediate? No. If Jeff was here, he'd correct my threat risk. No. Nope. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll lump them all in together. Need yep. a, we need a word that just combines threat risk and vulnerability yep. all into one. Right? <laughs> no, no. And like mm. uh, vulnerability reachability is mm-hmm. one, one of those things that, that comes as part of the exploit standard, the SBOM standard, uh, otherwise known as VEX. Yeah. Uh, so yep. uh, for as part of the enrichment. Yeah. Hey, we've got this product. It has these CVEs associated and it's it's vulnerable. But the particular functions that are vulnerable related to the CVE, we don't implement. So well, the exploit reachability is zero for this particular one because we don't implement the vulnerable functions. And that's where VEX for that SBOM right, can right. come in. Yep. But there's all kinds of, you. I mean, we know there's edge cases here. Of like, course. It could be exploitable tomorrow. Yeah, that's why it needs to have continual updates. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and this is the same sort of thing. So this is not just the 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 EU Cyber Resilience Act um, uh, uh, here in the U.S. The FDA with 524B yep. uh, also Josh, same, Josh is, was instrumental in that and we'll talk about that same, as well yep. same same thing um, the oh gosh executive order I can't remember what the it's like four, is, yeah. fourteen something 20, 20, nine, there's a nine in there is it niner <laughs> there's a niner say in there. niner um, but so there there's that one uh, also the 
a voluntary program from the FCC currently, Cyber Trust Mark, mm-hmm. which is still being being developed, also requires you know vulnerability management program, the sharing of customer data, and uh, the so. Cyber Trust Mark is now currently only targeted to consumer IoT gear that is connected to like Wi Fi and Ethernet. And con- for consumers, and it's a consumer protection type of program uh, managed by the FCC. And all of the major players, like the big Fortune 17 electronics manufacturers, um, they are all intending to be on board and have products on the shelves uh, with Cyber Trust Mark labeling mm-hmm. with all the appropriate documentation by Christmas season 2024. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, 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 Cyber Resiliency Acts in the EU is by 2026. Um, <clears throat> FDA 524B was last October. And right. they are currently turning stuff away that doesn't have the appropriate stuff. I, I think this is the, the 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 place where we need to be. We can't go on and protect our infrastructure, critical or not, yeah. our infrastructure, <clears throat> when vendors are just allowed to basically provide us with crap from a, a security standpoint. I mean, that's really the stance I'm taking. Like, we just we can't yeah. be expected to. Pre- we're at a significant disadvantage if we're expected to protect our infrastructure when we're delivered pure crap. It's an interesting place to be in the market. Mm-hmm. I do believe I may have been having that conversation with. What, whatever became of the today. cyber listing where we were supposed to have like a label on the box telling us this thing is secure. Cyber, so Did cyber, that, cyber, cyber UL. UL. Uh, there was a couple of initiatives to have a label. Yeah. Um, there was a few different ones. Cyber UL is the, the more popular one. Yeah. We actually conducted interviews with at least one other person that was working on a labeling system. I believe she was from a university. Uh, you could go in the archives and yep. try and, and try and uh, the, find there it. There are, uh, and I want to say, if I remember correctly, from the reading I was doing last week, there is a lot of cross-reference and um, to Cyber UL as part of the uh, Cyber U.S. Cyber Trust Mark stuff. So, Paul, can you grab me another beer? Yeah, there's vulnerabilities in your Canon printers. Nobody cares. I nobody nobody cares. I said no one cares. Why does no one care? <laughs> Historically, hold on, I gotta grab. Larry, I, I, you I know, know, you know I, what I was going to say. I know, I know who cares. Boris Federlich. <laughs> <laughs> when my printer's broken, oh, g- I g- call g- Boris. G- give me a... Oh, you want a different beer? Yeah, give me one of those uh, Konas. Sorry, I should have I specified what type of beer I would like. The Konas are Thank good. You. They're good. They are. They are. So why does nobody care, Paul, about your can printer? Because no, historically, ever since I've worked... At the so let's go back to my university days. This is what I, we do when we get old, right? As we we reminisce about the the good old days, right? Get off right? my lawn. Get off my lawn. When I was 20 years ago at the university, 20 plus years now, I, <laughs> wow, I'm old. Uh, I would scan the network and I'd find printers and they'd be vulnerable, and I'm like, this is bad. Printers are vulnerable. No one cared. Oh. 20 plus years ago, no one cared. Today, no nobody cares. I mean, we're just happy. If our printers do what they're supposed to do and print an effing document, let alone like I did, oh they're vulnerable to something, and I gotta and I gotta fix it. No, no one cares. No one cares. It's a printer. I was like, I don't want to piss off my printer. Like I'm like, I, I'm, I'm haven't you seen all the memes and videos? They're hilarious. I mean, I'm tired of it telling me I'm out of cyan to print black. Mm-hmm. Like seriously, like it's got a black cartridge for that. Have you ever seen the video where that. it's like the computer and the mouse and the keyboard and the printer? Right, and they're they're discussing what the user's doing, and they're like, "Oh no, they they want to print something," and the printer just like flat out refuses, and the printer's basically an asshole in the whole in the whole thing. Oh my god, it's so accurate. Yeah, well, we're paperless here. I gave up printing years ago. Why does anybody still print things? Uh, there's there's edge cases. Yep, there are very edge cases. Yeah, well, I mean, I print out receipts and stuff for, like, taxes, because, like, if I get audited, I've got to have paper copies of that. They don't want electronic records. Um, hmm. I'm trying to, oh, I, yeah, I hate to say this. Uh, I print recipes, <laughs> put them oh. on the counter so I can spill, you know so I I can spill stuff on it and not you be able to read it. You know what I do? Because my printer's such an asshole is I hand transcribe my recipes. <laughs> I stick it in a binder. 
I, I did this one the other day. I took a screenshot of it on my phone so I could just yes, put my yes, phone like yes. <laughs> That was yesterday's dinner. Um, yeah, but the problem is, is that now I'll never be able to find that again because mm. it's going to be in my photo library on my phone with about 30,000 images, and I'll never well, find that again. If you upload them all to Google Photos, you I'm, can use Google's ML. I, I, can, I can use uh, Apple stuff right on the phone to do text search for it, yeah, which is yeah. fine. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. So I, I, but I, no one I cares. I don't up. know. I mean, Bill, do you care about printer vulnerabilities? I uh, I agree with Sam. Why would anybody print? Like I have a I have a very strict rule that there are no printers that come inside of my house. Like um, just I don't want them. Now that being said, I've got a printer. I've got two of them, right? But like the the rule is I don't want I don't want them in my house, right? But they're both assholes. I hate them both. Like they're, they're literally asshole equipment, and now they're vulnerable, and you know I'm gonna get hacked. But. <laughs> <clears throat> yep, my printer's an asshole too, Bill. Like all of a sudden, we yeah, couldn't print the other day. Like, why? Why? Why can't you print? Oh, you disconnected from the Wi-Fi. Why did you disconnect from the Wi-Fi? Why did you disconnect from the Wi-Fi? Exactly. Why do you want paper from tray two instead of tray one? Like and, and historically, I and I don't, it's been tray one. And I don't why have a tray, tray two. two? I don't even, where is tray two? I don't even I don't have know. a tray two. <laughs> oh my god! I just the name of this episode is going to be printers are assholes. <laughs> printers are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it, Sam, okay? That's our answer. That's... Well, I appreciate the answer. <laughs> so so what was this vulnerability in this asshole? Anyway, I mean, this printer. <laughs> I, it's a CVS score of 9.8. What? The flaw requires immediate firmware update. Okay, so... Like, I'm not threatening my printer with a firmware update because it hates me already, and I hate it too. <laughs> and we have that kind of relationship. So if I have to go to my printer and be like... We need to do a, a, a firmware update, right? Like it's it's not going to go over well. It's not going to. I can't imagine how, like like how much it would not want to print after a firmware update because it already doesn't want to print. Why doesn't it have an automatic update? Because uh, they want you to pay for that in a subscription. Maybe, Maybe. <laughs> that's kind of where where printers are. I mean, that's where HP has taken printers. Basically, like you basically. We, we covered this before, but like HP in particular, and I'm not picking on HP, I'm just saying what I read about yep. HP, right, yep. uh, and their printer thing. And I watched interviews with HP's uh, CEO about talking about printers in, in the strategy, right? So I've done some of the research, and basically what I gleaned from that is HP wants you to essentially lease your printer, Right, they they lose money the when you when you air quotes buy a printer. Right, HP loses money. Now the CEO wouldn't say how much money they lose on average on a, on a printer, but he's like it's a loss. We sell it at a loss. Yep, because, in hopes you, because that you buy supplies from us. Yep, like ink cartridges <clears throat> to make up for that. And so that model, I mean, you, you're better off just like leasing your printer. Like I don't really want to. I don't really want to own it at that point. I mean, I, I think I might have a better relationship with my printer if I just leased it. Kind of like leasing a car, right? Like I put gas in it. If I lease a printer, I'll put some paper in it. And after three years, take my printer away and, and give me a new one, right? But, but put, enough, but, put enough ink in it or ship me enough ink to last me three years or whatever. And but, off to the but, races. But arguably at that point, like how much? I, I guess I, ink, like ink is more like gas than so yeah. much paper. And my, my question would be like, now, how much is the lease going to be on your printer? Like if you can pick up a decent laser printer for like 300 bucks, and it lasts you five years, right? What's your lease going to be like? Is it going to be like thirty dollars a month to lease your printer? Because then they'd make out like freaking bandits, right? I guess Listen, no one lease a printer. No don't one. do it. Come no, on. I, I agree, can't. Bill. I, we should like, like we don't need that shit. Just those things. Like those things suck. Don't lease it. Like Larry, like buy buy a three hundred dollar laser printer, and when it's when it starts being an asshole, throw it away. You don't need it anyway. Yeah, like, well, that would be the just... day I get it home. <laughs> 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 or maybe the day after, but like pretty shortly thereafter. It's, you, it's probably you... the day after because you get it home and you take it out of the box the next day and you try to put it on your network. <clears throat> it's usually nice to you the first the first print. It's yep. like oh, it, it it lures you in. Like oh, I'm yep. I'm I'm a printer. Look, hey, I printed a document for you. What more do you I want from me? Test then the page. next day, it's like nope. Yeah. Uh, so this article was was 
really light on details, and I think it's hilarious. Yeah, so, well, this is a, so, so I just want to point that out. Um, this website, securityonline.info, uh -huh. um, is pluses and minuses here. Uh, the plus is very timely, early access to vulnerabilities and stuff. Yep. The minus is uh, I think they are 100-ish percent um, AI chat GPT generated articles. Mm. But again, they're so like the, the first ones to the, publish. So something. the risk assessment, I'm going to skip ahead of when that. Uh, what can they do? Execute arbitrary code and in initiate denial of service attacks. Well, well, don't make my printer stop printing. It, it does that does on its that. own. Does it, that's a feature. It does that on its own. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the first line of the risk assessment, if an affected printer is directly exposed to the Internet without network safeguards, an unauthorized attacker could do those two things. And I'm like... Who put that printer on the? Oh wait, like go they, to Shodan and. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. there's your problem. There's right your there. there's your problem right there. Here's your sign, <laughs> but not printed from that printer. <laughs> now, now we can't hear Bill. What is going on with your audio? What are you using for a mic? Unplug it and plug it back in. Is it, is it the internal mic? Wow. Did you did you? Buy your mic through your place where you get your printer. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multifunction device. It's a printer and a microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's funny. That's what I get for using my printer as the mic, right? Like that. That's funny. Uh, you know what? What I was saying was, it, you know, it's kind of interesting these days. Think about how hard it would be to actually put a printer on directly on the internet. Like you would actually have to like actually like you know, take some time and effort to get that to happen, right? Yep. Like, yep. That, it's, it's surprising to me that those exist. But oh, shit, do. shit, I've got four extra IPs at home. Yeah, you should yeah. challenge accepted. Print your honey yeah. pot. Well, just think about all the cool stuff that would get printed. Like, you know, just the funny stuff that would make its way towards your printer. I know. Right? That would teach that asshole printer a lesson, honestly. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, I'll show you. I'm putting you on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and you're gonna take all these print jobs, and you're gonna like it. But the, I mean, the, the, but the cost to that exercise is the cost in paper, right? Because you know, some jerk's gonna just keep printing yeah. and printing and printing ASCII art images of the most horrible things that you could ever imagine, <laughs> and just keep printing those, or just keep printing pages of all black until you run out of ink. Good thing you leased it. Yep, that's why you lease it. You know, like I don't know, what's wrong with my printer? Send me a new one. <laughs> I put it on the internet. Oh, uh, so Paul, it was it was quite humorous, and I'm just I just had the moment when we talked about that some asshole is going to keep printing just paper and paper and paper, and it reminded me of something. And it was I thought I had a really good um, dad joke for the beginning of the show, mm. and it wasn't it. No, it was the Instagram video you sent me the other day. Oh. <laughs> Which, which one? Which I inadvertently watched at the dinner table with the volume on. <laughs> Bill, are you on Instagram? Oh, dude, you need to get on Instagram just so you can be like on my friends list of when I find ridiculous videos. You're on the list of people I send them to. It's like, a very short list. It's a very short list. It has to be a very short list because there's not a whole lot of people in this world that understand my level of humor. Yep. You and Larry are definitely on that list, yep. so you're missing out. We'll, just saying. We'll, we'll, that, we'll that save is the number one reason why I'm not on there, right? Like, I don't want to be. Is it the one where he's like, I went to the store to buy some Reese's and then I came back with a six pack of beer? And the moral I, of the story is I love titties. <laughs> <laughs> if you like that kind of content, you need to be on my short list on, on Instagram. That's what, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And I, I it was on with the volume up at the dinner table. Oh, I and love it. <sighs> I'm so glad you And I that. have a 10 year old. <laughs> <laughs> so for the rest of the night, it was blah, 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 dad of like. All right, you gotta go clean the dog turd up in the dining room, and just and the moral of the story was, <laughs> all right, that's enough. Of that. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Any, that's why I'm here. Uh, your story number three: QNAP fixed three flaws in its NAS devices, including an auth bypass. And I think what we're getting at here 
And I, I, and, I do want to hear if you and, and I think Lee put something very similar in um, Slack. I almost said IRC earlier this, this <clears throat> yeah, week. he did. But I, I think what we're getting at here is we could have like a really fun honeypot style network. If we took things like vulnerable QNAP storage devices, yep. printers, maybe some, some Wi-Fi routers yep. in that, and we just, we hang them out there on the internet. And we're like, you know what, internet? Have at it. And like the beautiful thing about a printer or a storage device is it's capturing the input and turning it into output, right? Like if it's a storage device, people can store all kinds of files there. Like just imagine the like crazy, interesting, amazing and horrific things we would collect with this honeypot. It would be awesome. I think so. We, we should do it. Jeez. Sounds like a bad idea. Jeez. That sounds like a bad idea. You've said that a lot to me in the in several mm. years. <laughs> and usually <laughs> we, we execute on those bad ideas, Bill. <laughs> That's right. Which is why I bring it up. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure this is the same thing. Like in the advice from QNAP, it's like, hey, you know, you shouldn't take your network attached storage and put it out on the internet. But people do anyway. Yep. Because I need my files, man. <sighs> Maybe they just don't know how to use SSH. Maybe. Because you can run SSH on Windows. Did you know that? Yeah. <clears throat> my story number 21 is uh, living off the land with native SSH and split tunneling. This is a great living off the land. Um, yep. So starting with Windows 10 version 1809, uh, from October 2018, Microsoft introduced a native SSH client to Windows, which allows users to connect to SSH servers directly from the Windows command prompt or PowerShell. This SSH client is a port of OpenSSH. Ever since we've seen that many of our clients have this optional feature enabled by default. <clears throat> and so what do attackers do? Sweet. SSH is here. As many of us know, on the show and listening, you, SSH is like the Swiss army knife of, of networking. Like it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I have like, a, like conceivably a whole other folder in the knowledge archive, which is like SSH tricks. Cause I can never remember the top of my head, all the things SSH can do. Uh -huh. So you go back through the archive of like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a proxy. A stupid it's SSH tricks. Pushing yeah. files, like the whole, the whole thing. And, since 2018, it's been available on Windows, which is interesting, and I've enabled that. And so this attack talks about <clears throat> organizations that have enabled it uh, by default. But if you're administrator on, if you have admin rights, you can just install it. So you get admin rights. Rather than tr bringing all the kinds of tradecraft that might trip all kinds of bells, alarm, and whistles, I'm just going to install SSH. Why not? So it's, it's a neat article. Yep, and then you've got all sorts of fun stuff that you can do. All sorts of fun stuff, for sure. As a, as to step back a little bit, that article uh, from Cisco Talos about mm. the uh, the PLC backplane sniffer, uh, they did that talk at S four last, oh, okay. last week in Miami. I didn't even know it. Nice, interesting. <clears throat> what else we got, Larry? Uh, what else? Oh, we didn't we didn't talk about the recent uh, shenanigans with uh, NVD. <sighs> I've got a whole folder for this one uh, in preparation for my talk. Yep. Uh, to to summarize. So yeah. So to to start, like you talked about it during uh, our interview, that uh, NVD's website has uh, a little banner on it saying, "Hey, oops, oops." We are not doing any more enrichment of um, CVEs um, because we're trying to put together a consortium to do this stuff. Um, and I, I picked up on this from uh, Angkor. Yeah, this is uh, 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 Eric Chin. Yeah, but I think it was also Josh, Bres Josh Bressers from Maybe. the Open Source Security podcast that had a hand in this research as well. Yep. So effectively, when they announced that they were going to start this consortium, uh, they stopped um, enriching um, CVEs 
uh, and effectively not developing CPEs or CVSS. Well, no, they they still well CVSS is um, determined by the submitter. Mm, right? No, no, yes and no. Okay, both. So this is because uh, there this are, is the double this is the double edged so, sword with this and, whole thing. And, and I say that and, I, and well, I'm going but because I looked at CVEs that were released last this within the last mm -hmm. five days and they have CVSS scores from the submitter or yeah. from NVD or mm -hmm. both. But like maybe from NVD, but if they've stopped adding those, right? They they would rely on what the submitter, right? Who could also be the organization that has responsibility for the software right which could inherently be biased right so one of the things in my besides charm talk that i will address is specific instances where i've seen three different parties right so you've got the organization that discovered the vulnerability the security researchers the software vendor and you've got nist or nvd right and i'm not I'm not knocking this because I have friends that work there and uh, you, you're doing great work. No, I'm not knocking you. But uh, all three organizations scored it, scored a particular vulnerability. All three organizations scored it differently. Yep. And my thing is, how does that, how does that help uh, enter, like other organizations that may have this software that are trying to evaluate it for like, what's my response? What's the, what's the, the what's the severity? Uh, I mean, how does it impact you is, is up to you, but what's the severity of this vulnerability? If three different organizations are scoring it and all three scores are different, well, how, how is this, is this helping? Our, is it hurting? Is it muddying the waters even more? It's, how, far, it, how far off were they? Were, I mean, when they were scoring, were they like significantly different or? By, by a point or two, but in a sense of, in some cases, it was like a high versus a critical, right? So like anything less than a 9.0 is not, is not critical. So 8 point something is high. 9.0 or above is, is critical. In a lot of organizations, I think because they haven't developed a more uh, advanced or, or uh, efficient method, go if it's critical, we should really evaluate it with more scrutiny and, and probably fix it, right? And they're, they're leaning on the CVSS score, right, wrong, or indifferent, they're leaning on the CVSS score. If collectively we can't agree what the CVSS score is, that's not really helping. Anyone. Well, what's funny about that situation is not not even knowing what you're what you're describing. I assume that the one that was very high was the researcher, right? Because man, I found this thing and it's right. bad, right? Exactly. And the one very low was the people that created the thing, right? And then like, the one in the middle is usually yeah. NVD, yeah. right? Yeah. So do yeah, we just yeah, we right. just average them together, right? That was my thing when I saw it. I'm like, do we just average these together? I think it was was it logo fail? It might have been logo fail uh, that I observed that. Yeah. Observed that. I have it in the document and it's gonna be in my slides and the talk and stuff, but I think it was logo fail where I observed that, right? And I mean, the, the real answer of criticality is specific to your environment. And that's what a lot of these scoring mechanisms can't take into account because there could be like even low, there could be in either direction, could be super critical rated like the vulnerability itself, super critical. But in your environment, you may have that software, but you're like, eh, like not super critical to me because of where it is and what systems is on and the criticality and the business function of those systems and whatever, right? But it could also be the opposite. Could be scored pretty low, but the impact, like it could be on a super critical system where even <coughs> a low or medium vulnerability is a big deal. So what does NVD enriched mean? <coughs> what, when they say that they're stopping doing that, what, what does the enrichment entail? So here's my understanding of it thus far, and I am not an expert on it, but I'm slowly trying to work my way to learn as much as I can from both reading and talking to people that have been engrossed in this for some time, uh, is that um, CVE is like a U.S. government program, and they contract out the execution of that program to MITRE, who is responsible for assigning and, and tracking CVEs, right? The enrichment from NVD at NIST is 
adding in the CVS, calculating the CVSS score and adding in the CPE, common platform mm-hmm. enumeration. So CVE says this is a vulnerability. NVD says this is the severity. And CPE, this is what platforms it affects. Right. And that's the, that's the enrichment yeah. and, and that so they're doing. And then CISA comes in. So th- this is like the whole, this is the whole debacle. Like we've got too many, too many scoring mechanisms from too many sources to, for any organization to like try and make sense of it. Because then CISA comes in and says, well, this CVE, we've observed being exploited in the wild. Therefore, we're going to add it to the KVP. Yeah. And, and the Kev, I'm not knocking the Kev. I'm just saying it's like another another kind of thing. But it, that's different from other mechanisms uh, large, I mean, there's open source projects that track it, but also commercial entities that will go, there's an exploit associated with this particular one. So like, there's a vulnerability, there's an exploit somewhere, but like we haven't observed it in the wild and, and, and those are, are different things. And so like making sense of all this is, is hard. And I, I hope to have some better recommendations once I actually get up on stage and, and present the talk, I hope to clearly articulate the challenges that I'm observing and have specifically observed in cases like this uh, that we're talking about right now. And in the past year, many stories that we've covered that do this and hopefully have some some sound advice uh, or at least guidance in the right direction of how you make sense of all this. Yep. Because in, in some cases, it's a complete train wreck. I mean, it is somewhat getting better. I do, I do like the fact that, I don't know, it's, again, it's, it's pros and cons. Like, more organizations are becoming their own CNAs, CVE numbering authorities, so they can maintain control of assigning CVEs to discovered vulnerabilities. So, like, recently, which I, I think is a positive thing, but it's probably specific to the Linux kernel. Um, the Linux kernel is its own CNA. CNA. So they don't have to rely on MITRE to issue CVEs. The Linux kernel team, specifically one person named Greg, is responsible for <laughs> triaging and assigning CVEs uh, for, by, for vulnerabilities in, in the Linux kernel. And the incentives there are, and, and Greg actually went on the Open Source Security podcast, uh, which is one of the reasons why I know his name, um, and did a great interview on that podcast with Josh and Kurt. And, you know, it it comes right out and says it. Well, we're all thinking. He's like, look, you can use a Linux kernel or you can not use a Linux kernel. I really don't care. Like, we're just trying to create awesome software in the Linux kernel. And when there's vulnerabilities, we're going to triage them to the best of our ability and we're going to fix them. I mean, if it's a vulnerability, we're going to identify it as such. And if it's not, we're going to call it a bug and we're going to prioritize and fix and move on with life. If you don't agree with what we're doing, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. It's like basically if you don't agree with what we're doing, See ya. Do something else. That, yep. that, you know, right? But that now translate that to a commercial entity, and that that doesn't necessarily play out. So I'm very uh, skeptical of this system working where the commercial entity. I mean, I'll, I'll slightly pick on Microsoft. I think overall they do a great job, right? But their ability to determine whether it's a vulnerability or a bug could be incentivized by economics, not necessarily. This is the right thing to do. Yep. Right. And I'm not saying, Mike, I'm, again, I'm picking on Microsoft. I'm not saying they do that. Again, I thought Jared DeMott's interview that he came on the show was a very fair assessment of what Microsoft has to deal with, how they're dealing with it. And I thought the great thing from that interview was, like, if we get it wrong, like, tell us why. Like, let's, let's work to fix it. And you know what? Uh, now we're not always going to get it right. Yep. And we may not even always, always fix it, but we're going to do our best. The, so the one that yeah, I'm glad you brought up the uh, Linux kernel one <laughs> as a CNA because that one is driving people nuts right now because there are a lot more CVEs being issued for the Linux kernel. Yes, I've noticed but that do too. You know, do you know why are there are a lot more CVEs? Because Linus has said every bug matters Ooh. and every bug in the Linux kernel is getting a CVE assigned to it. Every security vulnerability. No. Every bug reported in the Linux kernel is being reported as a CVE. I don't, that's not how Greg described it. This is new. I mean, when did Greg come on the podcast to talk about that? 
Uh, was it within the last three weeks? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Because that was what the kind of the stink has been in the industry. Like every bug in. Yeah, episode ex- episode 417 uh, is where uh, Greg KH from Linux kernel security team. Interesting. February 25th. Okay, so be, much, be, much before they started doing this. Like, they've only started doing this within the last <clears throat> two weeks. Mm. And Linus has basically, my understanding is that Linus has basically said every bug gets a CVE. Security related or otherwise. I bet you go look at some of is the... Bill talking? Is Bill talking? Is Bill on mute again? Are you trying to say something, Bill? Yep, he is. No? Yeah. No, he's yeah, messing with us. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> he's like a printer. <laughs> He only works when he wanted to, and he's an asshole. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my understanding is that, yeah, every, that's bug, right. every kernel bug. Yeah, exactly. It's not right. It's not right. If there's a vulnerability in a piece of software, yep. it should, in my opinion, get a CVE, right? Well, I mean, whether you fixed it or not, if it exists, will you stop moving your lips, Bill? It's really distracting. <laughs> if there's a vulnerability in software, it should get a CVE. Right? And it, we, we, we wrote about this uh, with a particular vendor that we identified a vulnerability. It's in this particular version of software. And they're like, well, <clears throat> in the next version of software, we removed that functionality. Therefore, it's fixed, and we're not issuing a CVE. I'm like, but... Go back to my definition of when there should be a CVE issued. There is a security vulnerability in a piece of software. That should get a CVE. Yeah. I don't agree with the the, the hand waving that happened in that particular scenario. Yep. Bill, do you have... So in my defense... Yes. In in my defense, you guys were nerding out about, like, NVD, CVE, CVSS, and a girl walked by him for me. So I I tuned you guys (laughs) out. I was talking... Moral of the the story. We didn't even get... We we talked about (laughs) KEV. We didn't get to EPSS. We talked about and CPEs. And what's the, the G, GHSA is the GitHub. Uh, bless you. Git, GitHub Security Advisory. There's VolDB. Uh, there's, uh, there's other ones, too. Yeah. Yep. There's, uh, oh, what is it? What is it called? There's the open, open, open source. Hold on. There's another one that I've been, uh, there's Google's uh, project that tracks vulnerabilities. And th- this is kind of my point. Like, there's too many ways to uh, to do all of this. Oh, and uh, re- related to this, uh, Anchor is having a meeting tomorrow. To OSV. Pro- there's to, OSV. To propose... Um, being able to track some of these things. So now we have yet something else to track. That's, that's one of my points. There's too many different ways to track this. Apparently, we're going to get more information this month at the NVD first conference happening in, in Raleigh. And I may actually, I don't think I could pull off attending, but I think they have a virtual attendance. I may try and attend that to get more information. So we'll see. It is unfolding. <clears throat> you playing with any cool hardware, Bill, Larry? Do any cool hardware stuff? Um, <clears throat> actually, I got some in the mail today. Um, I'm actually kind of excited about. Um, so, I, so viewers may may know this. This is uh, not necessarily anything new. Let me get it to a point where I can show it. But um, so. Uh, the, these are called the 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 cheap yellow the the cheap yellow display is what this is called, um, mm-hmm. and it it comes with a a uh, a, a touch screen attached, um, and as you can see uh, from the back, it's powered by uh, NESP thirty two, right? And uh, what what got yeah what got me going? You know, like I've I've been an ESP thirty two guy for for a long time. But uh, how I came across this was uh, 
I saw that the Marauder firmware um, that oh, yeah. you know you guys probably probably are familiar with with the, yeah. the Flipper. Yep, yep. the ESP32 Marauder. Yep. Yeah, has been ported to, to this device. Now, what's cool about what's cool about this is it's twelve bucks. Um, mm. and yep. Touch screen and and everything. And so, um, you know, while while you guys were were talking, I was seeing what it would take to to port that that Bluetooth uh, mm. or the uh, nice. the speaker. Uh, you know, the Regatron. Uh, see if we could get that going on here, but. Um, you know, just the hard, hardware right now is just so cheap and, and oh uh, powerful, gosh. you know, pretty neat. Hopefully we can get this thing banned in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, Bill, if you get a chance to send that to me, I'm, I'm interested yep. because the cool. Just Call Me Coco, uh, like hardware shop uh -huh. is always sold out. Yep. And they've got some really cool, uh, not just boards, but like really cool enclosures. With antennas attached to it, I'm like, that thing's super cool. And yeah, Bill, your point, like, you can go buy the the bit for whatever, like twelve dollars, right? But then you can, like 3D print the thing and maybe solder on your own antenna connectors or or whatever, which is cool. But like, I I don't have time, but like, I want to buy one all put together because that looks. I saw a picture of it and like, it's really cool. Um, but they're always sold out. So now I'm like, maybe I just need to 3D print my own case and. Yep. I know people with 3D printers. I don't yep. have one yet. That's an area I want I want to Dude, I got one on if the you list want for this year. I, I got one if you want it. If you want to let the kids tinker with it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You got an Ender 3? Yeah, yep, Ender 3 version let 2. Let me show you some other hardware. Uh, let me show you guys some other hardware that I recently picked up. So I have no. uh, Full stack of in original boxes. So these are new old stock Radio Shack tone dialers. And a whole baggie of crystals. Of uh, of crystals. So uh, nice. yeah, the, like um, where the hell know, did you the, the where the East, hell did you find those? Yeah, eBay, man. Like I just I set up uh, I set up a uh, a search, and yep. you know just when they pop up, I buy them, and uh, you know I've got I've actually got a whole stack of them over there. But uh, that's awesome. Like I is just, that, I is mean, that for like that like you're gonna build your own like red box kind of thing? Yeah, so like you know, like we probably haven't talked about it, but that's how I got my start in hacking was was freaking. Um, well, I was just huge into it when I was a teenager. Didn't know really. I still have my original tone dialer, uh, the one that the one that I used in the past. Um, so this, uh, sorry, cut away there. But so this one, th this was the one that that I built when I was a teenager. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, it says it's not to be handled by unauthorized personnel, right? Like, and it was spray painted red. You know, the spray paint's kind of like... Uh, it's well used. Kind of on. But, uh, yeah, you can see that certain buttons have been well used over time. Um, but it just, just, you know, brings back uh, hacking memories, you know, the uh, the old tone dialers. But, uh, you know, so that that's some, some hardware that I'm pretty excited about. I saw, awesome. I saw a thread somewhere this week that was talking about red boxing and I'm not sure what hardware they they had built like I saw it and I read some of the comments but like trying to find when I mean, you're talking about finding a payphone but it's really more about finding a telephone it doesn't have to be a payphone that connects to a phone switch that it's still is still vulnerable to yeah. that I don't think there's too many left it, in it, the US there, there's none left no there are no 5 ESS switches left in the United States or in the, on the planet for that matter no I thought I thought some other countries had, nope. had them no nope. the last one in the US I remember reading an article was turned off years ago right so, yeah, it was so some in some middle of nowhere town or something yeah, like it was that? it was in the mid 90s if I remember correctly or mid to late 90s it was turned off hmm. Yep, there are no vulnerable. There, to the best of my knowledge, there are no vulnerable five ESS switches. But we should ask the former freaker. <laughs> oh, and Bill's and he's on mute. <laughs> Is it not mute? Is it just to, to, like, so the the challenge would be like, are you leasing your your microphone and? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the printer. Uh, but so my, my thing that would be awesome is like we've emulated so much of this old stuff now. Mm -hmm. Like, and we, what was it? There was Shady Tell that at uh, one of the yeah. camp, the camp uh, conferences that stood up a telephone em network. Emulation Tor for the stuff, Tor right? Camp, I believe. Was it Tor, Tor camp. camp? Yeah. So why could exactly. we, why could we not emulate a vulnerable 5ESS mm. on all this new hardware? Like that would be cool. 
I, I think they did. I, yeah, I, we, I think first so of all, we, we can, and I think that I think that they did, right? Um, I think there was some vulnerable PBXs on there. I, I, I think that uh, you know that red boxing worked. You know, like all oh, yeah, blue boxing worked. Mm -hmm. You know, the trunk lines were set up. Those, those kind of things. Yeah. And, well, I know. Yeah, I know, I know Shady Tell leveraged some Cisco telephony. Uh, to Ethernet type of gear, but I don't think it was old enough to support 5ESS and vulnerable to that stuff. <clears throat> but yeah, awesome. So, piece well, of, yeah. real quick, piece of hardware that uh, I found today that I have not purchased um, <clears throat> is the uh, Helltech uh, HTIT WB32LA. Um, it is an ESP32 powered board with a small um, LCD panel, um, but the wireless modules were a piece of crap. So some guy wrote drivers for it mm. and it supports LoRa. Yeah, I see that. Ooh. 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 Yeah. Oh, well, I think I saw that. I, it's, this on, picture it's on Hackaday. Looks, yeah, it's on okay, Hackaday. I did see this on Hackaday. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I get to pick up some of those because uh, I want to. I need to build some lower stuff. Mm. Uh, we talk about Lora in uh, the IoT hacking class. I feel like uh, Li LilyGo has some lower stuff. They do. Stuff yep, yeah. a lot of mesh tastic stuff. So specific applications of mm. it, uh, but not a lot of um, hacking tools. Not a lot of network access tools uh, that are easy to use and inexpensive. And these things are like you know under the twelve dollar mark. So yeah, these are these are gonna be fun. On that note, we will conclude this episode of Ball Security Weekly. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. We'll see you next time. Larry, take us out. Over and out, Fiora. <laughs> <laughs>